Welcome to the Wisconsin Podcast. I'm Craig Sauer. On this podcast, we talk Wisconsin things, everything from media, sports, culture, nature, politics, and more. Born and raised in France, owner and head winemaker at Wallersheim Winery, Philippe Cocard comes from a family of winemakers. Cocard was immersed in winemaking and viticulture from a young age, growing up helping on his family's farms and tasting wine with his father and uncles. He later went on to earn degrees in winemaking, viticulture, and wine marketing. He came to America and Wallersheim in the 1980s and became the winemaker in 1985. Although at the beginning, the winery was a humble operation, Wallersheim Winery grew rapidly and gained national media attention with the introduction of its Prairie Fumé wine in 1989. In the coming decades, Wallersheim became one of Wisconsin's most well-known wineries. But success as a Wisconsin winery hasn't always been easy, according to Cocard. So we attended many trade show, restaurant show, wine show, everywhere we could be on a Friday night or Saturday or weekend to do a wine tasting, we were there. And a couple times, well, let's say a dozen times, uh, we would say, hey, would you like some Wisconsin wine? And literally people would pull the glass away from us, just (laughs) like, oh, no, it's all sweet, it's... Um, it's all those fruit wine, it's all sweet wine. So, you know, pretty much slapped in the face or insulted. While Wallersheim doesn't have the long history of some wineries, its location near Prairie du Sac does. The property was first planted with vineyards in the 1840s by Hungarian noblemen, who later helped found the California wine industry. Both the wine and brandy were made on site until Prohibition, after which the property was used for dairy farming. But in 1972, the Wollersheim family purchased the property and brought winemaking back to the land. I stopped by the winery in mid-February, in the midst of a particularly tough Wisconsin winter, which featured extreme cold. I chatted with Cocard about dealing with the cold, the growth of the winery, and his love of wine, food, and family. This might be a hard one, but uh, do you have a favorite grape? Uh, Favorite grapes, uh, Pinot Noir. Uh, Pinot Noir is one of the uh, most mysterious, um, fancy, classy, uh, delicate, uh, very transparent. Uh, It will uh, pretty much tell the story of how it's grown, where it's grown, um and the quality of the winemaker and in winemaking meaning that cab syrah merlot are what we call big grape malbec is uh, uh, upcoming um those those last four uh, syrah cab merlot malbec zin so on are really good but because of their bigness, they are so big, um, it is, quote-unquote, a little bit easier to hide flaws and winemaking mistake because the those grapes are, are not delicate like a Pinot Noir is. So, uh, for instance, um, it is difficult to achieve finesse uh, with a cab or Syrah or Malbec and so on. Pinot Noir uh, will pretty much let you see through the wine um, how good, classy, fine, prestigious it can be. Do you like to eat them as well? Like, are they like good to eat? We always Just, eat grapes yeah. all the time. Uh, I mean, we eat table grapes year round and we eat grapes in the vineyard. Uh, even when they are uh, disgustingly acidic green, <laughs> but it's part of upbringing. It's part of growing up around a vineyard. Uh, but during the crush, um, I bet you I eat three, four pounds of grapes. Wow! Uh, so it, it it 
that's a good sugar buzz, <laughs> <laughs> which sometimes we need for long days. But yeah, we we taste. It's one way of um, finding out um, the harvest date. You know, the harvest date will really dictate the quality of the wine. Uh, if you pick too green, you have a green wine. If you pick too late, uh, you have issue with stability, with uh, uh, lots of issues. So finding the picking date as a winemaker is one of the toughest decisions you have to make. Uh, so we do eat grape, we taste grapes all the time, flavor, feel, color, intensity, and so on. Hmm. Uh, do you ever drink beer? Are you, are you, you live in a great beer state, obviously. Uh, do you, do you like beer? I just started to, I would say, uh, four or five years ago. I drive a pickup truck. I drive a Harley Davidson, but I don't drink a lot of beer. Uh, my son-in-law, who is the distiller at the distillery, kind of got me into drinking beer and I do enjoy, uh, beer, um, a couple, actually last Friday night, we had uh, a wine versus beer dinner at the Vintage here in Sox City. It was great fun. Mm -hmm. uh, Trent Kramer, the owner of, uh, and his wife, Brittany, um, the owner had organized a, a wine versus beer dinner. And, and the chef uh, paired the, the food and the wine. And it was great. And I enjoy all the beers. Prior to that, we had done a uh, line and Kugel uh, beer dinner. It was very interesting and getting to know the history of those people uh, and, you know, all the, the craft beer and the smaller beer. Um, I'm not a big brand uh, beer drinker. I do like to know how it's made and what mm -hmm. it took a lot like wine you know mm -hmm. but you're still going to the wine first right oh yeah uh, <laughs> oh yeah yeah <laughs> uh so you're from france right originally um what's kind of the most similar thing about france and wisconsin and maybe the most dissimilar thing about france and wisconsin wow um you know i've been at this 35 years and things have changed dramatically in 35 years. The biggest difference, and it's, it's starting to change in the right direction, I think is the food culture. Uh, food and wine uh, and uh, enjoying beer and spirits uh, are all tied. Uh, for the French culture, food and wine are the meal. It's part of the meal. Um, in the U.S., uh, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, it was very separate, you know. Um, food was rather boring 35 years ago, meat and potato. Mm -hmm. uh, today is like, whoa, mm -hmm. what happened? It's completely different. So you see more interaction between uh, wine and cocktail and beer going with food. Uh, so I think it is maybe the greatest difference, but now it's coming together. And it's really nice to see that. And what are some like similarities you would, you would, you find when you found when you moved here that was like, oh, that's, that's like just like back home or something like that or some, something the two places have in common, if anything? Um, I think the rolling hillside, uh, not the weather, <laughs> <laughs> not the weather. Uh, I mean, I had never seen ice and snow in this quantity. <laughs> uh, you have to go in the Alps mm -hmm. or uh, in the mountain area to see that. But it, uh, it, let's say it has gotten a lot closer mm. uh, uh, as part of... Um, culture, understanding, way of doing, it has gotten a lot closer in, in the last 35 years mm -hmm. than it was when I came. Mm -hmm. So was it different? Yes, it was very different. What were the similarity? Uh, farming, um, cows and dairies, uh, 
uh, corn and wheat are, I would say, the scenery was very mm. uh, familiar. Mm. Uh, the stone buildings, um, like this winery, built of limestone. Um, in Europe, all the buildings are stone, not wood. Uh, so I would say the, the scenery was familiar. So I know you're, you're a motorcycle guy. Uh, do you remember the first time you rode a Harley? Oh, yeah. I remember the very first time I rode a Harley it had to be the spring of 2000. Um, prior to that, I had uh, drove Suzuki's, uh, motocross, enduro, uh, speed bikes, um, but never Harley. And, you know, that was part of this um, long a childhood dream that I had since I was 12 years old, uh, even eight years old, collecting the American flag and collecting um, uh, the little uh, Camaros and Corvettes and all that stuff, the, the American art, the, the American dream. And, um, uh, you know, I stuck through this, and that's kind of how I ended up here, uh, sticking through that idea. And uh, so Harley was... Um, it was one of those wishes, but, you know, coming to the U.S. with a suitcase and 50 bucks, um, I, I couldn't even think or dream of affording one. Um, and uh, in 2000, my father-in-law gifted me the first Harley, kind of as a back payment <laughs> because you know the expression we started without a pot to pee in uh, that was us you know mm. i mean we literally started with a uh, little to nothing uh, and we built up built up this business um and uh the switch went on in 1988 uh, 1989 when we created the prairie fumet um but prior to that we had we didn't understand cash flow and so owning a Harley was just a dream and uh, the rumbling and the noise and the sound that it makes uh, so riding the first Harley was the spring of 2000. You, you talked about at the beginning some like kind of uh, this was not maybe not all here at the beginning right this, is not, this building probably wasn't here I mean what allowed Wellersheim to be so successful? And what was it that over the last 30 years that's, it's grown so tremendously? I, you know, I, I will, um, well, there is a few things that really got us on the right path. Um, no money. Uh, so we had to work hard for it. <laughs> uh, we didn't have uh, capital venture. We didn't have outside investors. Uh, we didn't have a cash cow. We didn't have, um, we didn't have funds. So it was just like, well, we can only spend what we have. And we relied on a loan from the Bank of Prairie du Sac to operate the business. My father-in-law was an engineer, extremely intelligent man. So is we fix it all. We make it all. We, we worked hard and we worked Saturdays and we worked Sundays. And um, I, was it easy? No, it was rather difficult because we didn't have the, the finance. So, uh, you know, stuck to it, dedicated to quality, uh, quality uh, ahead of private life sometime, you know. <laughs> uh, you do what it takes to make it good. Um, and uh, so those maybe were the fundamental basis of our business. Uh, and 1988, I created the wine called Prairie Fumé, uh, which is a Saval Blanc base. Uh, it's the grape uh, from Michigan. Saval did not grow well here. It was not winter hardy enough, so we bought several grapes from Michigan, pressed them, collected the juice, made the wine very fruity, very aromatic, stopped the fermentation, so it has low alcohol, natural sweetness, uh, no sugar added, 
a crisp, fresh, fruity. And that was 1988, spring of 1989. It won four gold medal nationwide, and uh, the story got out. And then from that point on, uh, business has grown, let's say, from uh, 30,000 bottles to 1.3 million bottles of wine. Uh, and so that's kind of what happened because of that wine. We were able to uh, generate cash flow. We were able to increase the loan size. Um, and because of the Prairie Fumé uh, customer and store buyers in the Madison area uh, believed in the brand and it, uh, it got rolling, it got growing, and we were able to uh, hire more people, uh, invest in equipment, invest in people and more equipment and expand buildings. And, um, yes, we went from, um, eight, nine thousand gallons to 250,000 gallons of wine. So it's a, a huge increase. Is it hard to, uh, I, I imagine at the beginning when you're kind of first getting going, um, there's probably a stigma that of a winery from Wisconsin, right? There's, they make wine there, you know, um, how have you kind of overcome that o over time? That was a huge issue. Um, and that's one we struggled with, uh, personally with my father-in-law, uh, Prairie Fumé had won medals all over. Prairie Fumé was, a wine ahead of its time. It's basically the Pinot Grigio's of today. And it was really good. And so we attended many trade show, restaurant show, wine show, big tastings. And I mean, we traveled the state of Wisconsin. We traveled to Chicago. We traveled to Milwaukee, uh, Green Bay, uh, Eau Claire, you name it. We, everywhere we could be on a Friday night or Saturday or weekend to do a wine tasting, we were there. And a couple times, well, let's say a dozen times, uh, we would say, Hey, would you like some Wisconsin wine? And literally people would, pull the glass away from us just <laughs> like oh no it's all sweet it's um it's all those fruit wine it's all sweet wine so you know darn it you know it's just like we know it's better than that so few tasting i mean we we got pretty much slapped in the face or insulted um later on we stopped saying would you like some wisconsin wine we just said hey would you like to try this white wine would you like to try this red wine and wow, it is so good. Well, where is it from? Oh, it's from Wisconsin. Well, I didn't know we could make such good wine in Wisconsin. I didn't know there was so many such good wine in Wisconsin. And that's how we were able to turn the table around completely. So I would say for almost 10 years, we didn't even advertise the Wisconsin uh, statement, provenience, location. We just let the wine show and spoke for themselves. Nowadays, today is Wisconsin pride mm -hmm. is we are in Wisconsin. We've been here for 46 years. We are proud of what we do. We grow Wisconsin native grapes. We grow French American hybrids. We buy grapes outside of Wisconsin. We make it all here on site. We use Wisconsin oak. Uh, we were one of the first winery in the U.S. to have a custom-made barrel, 50% French oak, 50% Wisconsin oak, and that was 25 years ago. Uh, today, we use a lot of Wisconsin oak uh, in the wine as well as the distillery. We must be one of the, f maybe the only distillery in the nation to use 100% Wisconsin oak in our bourbon, in our brandy, and lots of our wines have 100% Wisconsin oak as well. So Wisconsin flag is everywhere for us. Do you feel like you, Wallersheim, really kind of set the tone for th the fact that you can make wine in Wisconsin and that allowed all these other wineries to kind of filter in and kind of grow up in the last 30 years? Absolutely. And, you know, if it wasn't for Bob Wollersheim and if it wasn't for me and the Prairie Fumé, 
there would not be a Wisconsin wine section uh, as big as it is. Uh, would have there been other? Yeah, most likely, certainly. But uh, Prairie Fumé is one of the number one skew wine in the state of Wisconsin. Prairie Fumé opened the door for all the other wineries. Um, and yes, Bob Wolersheim and myself, but Bob first, uh, knock at all the doors of bars and restaurants and stores. Hey, would you like to try? And yeah, was it a struggle? A huge struggle. Did it sell? Not really well at first, but it people gave us a chance. People believed, and then suddenly Prairie Fumé sold. Then it really uh, grew the section of Wisconsin wine. And now you have entire uh, shelves. You know, you have 20 feet, 30 feet. You have, you go to uh, any given big wine store, uh, you will see uh, 25 different brands of Wisconsin wine. So yes, I would say with pride, we have certainly helped in creating a Wisconsin wine section. What What is the kind of, reputation of Wisconsin wine outside of Wisconsin these days? Uh, tough questions. Um, outside, Wisconsin wines, even in Wisconsin, uh, still have a long way to go. And uh, we, I say we as the industry um, with the Wisconsin Winery Association, with the Wisconsin Grape Grower Association, uh, are fighting hard, uh, struggling to get our message across. Um, we have worked really hard on improving quality of the wine with stainless steel equipment, with lab, with understanding pH and oxidation and sulfite level and you name it. Even when it comes to growing the grapes, what grapes grow, how to grow them. So there is very little effort in my thinking left to do in the how to grow the grape or how to make the wine. The biggest struggle is marketing, is for the customer and the store owners and the restaurateurs is give us a chance, try it. Why, you know, it's mind boggling. It's uh, upsetting when you see what's going on. And we leave it, breathe it, uh, smell it, drink it, think it, dream it. It's our life. You could have a garbage Italian wine or French wine or California wine or Washington or Oregon walking anywhere with a red carpet. You could have the best Wisconsin wine getting the door slammed in our face. And that is changing. And it's changing with, I would say, new, uh, more upfront, more the food culture that we talked about. Um, uh, maybe the new generation, your age group, a new generation of chef, a new generation of chef of owners that have grown hearing about mm -hmm. Wisconsin wine. And yeah, let's, let's give those guys a chance. And so I think it's going to get better. There is a lot of, you know, it's the slow food movement started 25 years ago, uh, has a big part in this, you know, slow food, local, everything local, um, local pride, local product. Um, in our business, we call that terroir, you know, which is the taste of the soil. That's where your roots are. Uh, terroir is becoming big in beer and um, spirits, which in the wine business, it's been there for 200 years, but it's good to uh, learn from that. So, I do think it's going to get a lot better in the years to come um, where Wisconsin anything 
Wisconsin wine, um, beer and spirit will have a prominent place uh, on the menus. So for a, a person who isn't really familiar with a lot of wine and maybe some of the names of, of the wines that you make, uh, explain like what is kind of your brand or what kind of taste, or what, what kind of wine do you make here for the, for the non-educated wine person? So our story is a little bit different than, um, let's say, a, a new startup winery. A new startup winery today has the luxury of having new grapes that uh, were not available to us 40 years ago. And today uh, you have Market, which is a red grape, La Crescent, which is a white grape, San Pepin, uh, Frontenac, Frontenac Gris. All those grapes can make wine of outstanding quality. The winemaking knowledge has to be there. The winemaking education has to be there. So growing the grapes, having the grapes doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a great wine. It does take um, knowledge. And I see that I see that we could do a little bit better. You cannot sell insurance or be a banker or a pharmacist and become a winemaker overnight. Uh, even after five years, you just don't know. Um, it takes a long time. And as a winemaker, we have one chance a year to make a good wine. A chef can do it 10 times a day. A beard guy can do it every day, every week, all the time. If the beer doesn't taste good, throw it away. Start with grain and water and yeast. You can ferment beer. We have grapes only once a year. September, October, early part of November. If you miss out, it's not going to be there. So going back to your question, our styles of wines uh, starting 46 years ago, were locally grown grapes, French American hybrid, Foch mostly that you see outside here. Uh, this slope is 46 years old. Um, and, uh, it makes a Rhone style, uh, big red, soft red, barrel age, very traditional. Uh, what does it compare to? A Côte du Rhône, a big Beaujolais style, not quite a Burgundy. Uh, it's a little bit fuller and bigger than a Burgundy uh, wine, um, but can it compete with uh, any wine in the world? Absolutely. Um, on the white side, we do... Um, uh, Seval Blanc. Uh, Seval is um, a Pinot Grigio style, fresh, fruity, crisp, and light. Early In the early years, we started to buy Riesling grapes, Chardonnay grapes, Pinot Noir grapes as well. Uh, so uh, what I would say is traditional European style wine, as well as semi-dry, fresh, and fruity, semi-sweet as well. You know, catering to the taste of our customer. Our customer uh, in the early days were coming from the Rhine wine, the Chablis style. I mean, you're talking 40 years ago. Um, and Germanic heritage, semi-sweet was big, sweet sour is big in the culture. It has changed. Uh, today, people are looking at big reds, um, but sweet steel sales. So what would be the biggest difference between Wisconsin wine, our wine, and California wine is uh, the semi-sweet and sweet taste that the Midwest has comp compared to the West Coast. And that goes the same for, you know, New York State, Pennsylvania, Ohio. I would say anything out east to the Midwest, uh, it would be on the sweet to semi-sweet, semi-dry. There's a large category of that. 
West Coast wine, uh, being Washington, uh, Oregon, and California, more on the drier side, more European side. So we do some of each. When you're talking there, like you, you, see, you said you get once a year to kind of get, get it right, right? Um, so how do you approach like experimentation and like trying new things? Because obviously as a winery, you want to like try new things and follow trends a little bit. But like, how do you, how do, you do that with, with grapes when like, how do you mix in? Like, how is it as a business? How do you do that? Well, so let's start from, let's start from the, the origin of the wine, the grapes. It takes five years. It takes four years to get your first crop. And, you know, I am a 13th generation winemaker. You don't see the best grapes in your vineyard on the fourth year or the fifth year or the sixth year. A vineyard need to be 12 years old to really know what the style of the grapes is going to be. So, you know, it's very, it's kind of interesting. And sometimes I, I've been doing this for 35 years right here at Wallersham Winery, plus all the years of working with my grandparents, my dad, my uncles, my cousins, and so on. And sometimes I sit back and smile and listen all the the new winery getting so excited about market makes such a best wine in this. Well, there's so little history of the growing of the grapes. And everybody turns those grapes into a blush. Oh, Frontenac makes the, makes the best blush. No, you could make an outstanding big red wine if you know how to make a good red wine. So, the, so it will take four or five years for the grapes to grow. Then it will take another four or five years to know if the vineyard is going to withstand a 30 below zero like we just had. So, and that's why we stick to what we know Foch in the upper Midwest does, has already proven to survive. So you get, you get grapes, you get new grapes. What are they, um, what are they fitted to make? Are they fitted to make a blush? Are they fitted to make a light fruity wine? Are they fitted to make a big reserve style? A lot has to do with the growing season. So you add another component is the weather. You know, dry year, green year, wet years. Um, and then you turn those grapes into wine. Choice of yeast. You have 25 to pick from. Temperature. A range from 90 Fahrenheit to 55 degrees Fahrenheit of fermentation. Completely different style of wine. And your taste buds. And that is where... Um, a lot of, uh, again, a lot of education has to happen. Pe I mean, people have to teach themselves how to taste wine, what makes a good wine versus a bad wine. So you, I think as a winemaker, you go with your gut feel. You go with like, wow, this is, this is what I am trying to attempt. And you have to be able to relate the taste while it's being uh, made to the lab, say, okay, 23 bricks, 19 bricks, pH 3.2, pH 3.55, pH 3.62. What is it going to do? What is it going Well, pH 3.62, you're not going to make something light, fresh, and fruity. It's already passed. It will be soft, big, and round. So you cannot make a big red at pH 310. That's impossible. It's green, astringent, urbaceous, not, not very uh, flowing and interesting. So there's uh, so many issues. And how do we experiment? At first, we experiment with 10 gallons, 50 gallons. Today, we experiment with 500 gallons. We experiment with 1,000 gallons. Before, we do a 5,000-gallon tanks. We will do a thousand gallon or we will do 500 gallons to experiment with a new yeast. What do we get out of that yeast? We were told by the yeast supplier that, oh, it's supposed to be soft and round. Is it? That's what they think. We're going to put it to the test. So for us at our size, if we have a mishap on 500 gallons, we can find a place where it's going to be uh, quote unquote hidden. Um, is it going to be bad? No, it's, it won't be to our standard of quality. What we are looking for into that wine to be 
good uh, for our brand. So I want to talk a little bit about your, your personal story a little bit. We've talked a little bit about it. You grew up in France. Um, how did you, why did you come to, to America, to Wisconsin specifically, and kind of what kept you here? Um, so, you know, it's kind of, it's an interesting story. Um, my grandma uh, was a big supporter of uh, America. Uh, my parents were eight years old when the American troops walked through the villages uh, freeing France uh, from the German occupation. And as a kid, you know, growing up, eight years old, 10 years old, 12 years old, um, hearing uh, how much um, pride and respect and worship my grandma had for the American soldier. And both my mom and dad, you know, we always, oh, this is where uh, two American soldiers got killed. This is where two British soldiers got killed. We, it's part of my upbringing, you know. Um, so always hearing my grandmother and my parents talking so highly about America, it planted the seed. And then, you know, collecting the American flag and wanting to come to America. So throughout my schooling, I stuck to that idea. I wanted to come to the U.S. And... Um, so I did a general, general ag school, and then um, I went to college for winemaking, wine marketing, and then um, I pretty much has a, had a job lined up in France, and I told uh, this, the guy who wanted to hire me, I said, no, I'm not ready to take the job. I want to come to the U.S., and so I threw a chamber of commerce in France and FFA in America, there was an exchange of students, and that's how I connected with the two. That's how the two organizations connected. I was one of 10 uh, intern selected wanting to come to the US. Bob Wallersheim picked my name on the listing of FFA exchange students in 1984. I landed, uh, I actually from Washington, D.C to Madison on a Greyhound bus. And Bob picked me up at the Greyhound bus station in Madison, uh, March 27th, 1984. And I couldn't speak a word of English. <laughs> um, it was cold. I had a little light jacket. <laughs> and um, anyhow, so I landed here at this winery. Um, got along with Bob. Um and then later on fell in love with his daughter, uh, Julie, my wife. Uh, we've been married 32 years. Uh, we have three kids. Uh, we own the business. Um, so I've seen this place grow from a tiny little farm uh, to the business it has become. So uh, at first, uh, I mean, love kept me here. There is no question about it. Uh, not the weather, <laughs> and not the food culture, <laughs> but uh, being in love with uh, my wife uh, uh, kept me going um, through the highs and the lows, uh, and it has gotten a lot better, as, as you can tell. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I think you, some some of your story kind of tells like there's there's always been this since probably the World War II and maybe before this love affair between America and France and France and America. And sometimes it goes it's up and down. But uh, I think generally there's this huge appreciation between the two countries. Um, so, I mean, being a winemaker in Wisconsin or in the United States from France, I mean, there must have been like a lot of just interest in you and like. You know, uh, what has that been, experience been like is having this French, you know, background being in the United States, living here all these years? Uh, I would say only good. I have never felt uh, weird about it. Um, always has been that uh, love and respect for each, each other's as country, as culture. Um, yeah, you always have 
a politician throwing right, a right. wrench into this, uh, more unfortunately because of difference of opinion when it comes to the Middle East, when it comes to uh, the wars. Uh, but, uh, you know, sometime, you know, uh, during one of the Gulf War, there was some anti-French backlash. <laughs> that, right. that was a little bit worrisome, but not for me here in Wisconsin. Um, I have never put the French flag forward. Uh, after 30 years, we have a French flag and a German <laughs> flag and an American flag because we couldn't afford it earlier. So now we have uh, three pole um, flags um, and very proud uh, of here, yeah, proud of it. Uh, I became an American citizen with a lot of pride. Um, so my French background is huge. Uh, this is, it's where I bring the food and wine culture together. Uh, I have embraced this country. I have embraced Wisconsin. I have so many friends. My life is here. Uh, do I miss friends? Not really. Do I miss my parents and my uh, immediate family? Yes. Uh, but my life is here, and this is my focus. Um, I love where I am. Wine, I think, in, in a lot of ways, probably equals family to you because, as you were saying earlier, 13th generation. Um, for an American, uh, 13 generations, like, that doesn't, that, you know, that's, that's almost impossibly, like, long. What do you know about, like, your early beginnings of your family? You know, I mean, we're talking hundreds of years. Like, what, what do you know about your, your history as, in winemaking? Well, actually, a credit to my son, uh, Roman, uh, during his, uh, during one of his business school at, uh, UW Madison had to do, um, some research. And so he went to France for a couple of weeks and with my dad, that's all they focused on. And looking at, I mean, even digging into family archives and going to, you know, archives, uh, of the, um, uh, the county or the department and so on. And what I understood is, um, sometime around, late 1500, early 1600, one of my great, 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 great grandfather had to require permission from the, the, the local kingdom or the local senior if he could uh, press his own grapes. Because all the little, all the, the little farmers uh, as a way of paying protection or paying taxes would take their grapes to the castle, to the senior of the county. Um, and the, the, there was one winery and that's where the wine would be made. So somewhere around, uh, early 1600, my son and my dad found a written permission from a senior somebody allowing one of my ancestors to have its own press. So having your own press, then you can process the grapes. You can press them right away to make white wine, or you can press them two or three weeks later after fermentation to make a red wine. And that's how it started. And so on both sides of my parents, mom and dad, uh, and the written document was on my mother's side. Both my parents are from Beaujolais, which is south of Burgundy. Both family were peasants, grape growers, farmers. Uh, on my mom's side, they became more nobles. Uh, they had small prop, I mean, small castle, big property. Um, and on my dad's side, they were all, uh, peasants and farmers and uh, grape growers. And that goes back, you know, through the 1600, 1700, 1800, 1900, up to today. I have cousins, uh, cousins and uncles, uh, still, uh, grape growers, winemakers. 
And I, I think it, it's continued in the next generation too, down. I think your, your daughter's involved in the winery. Um, what's it like to share that with uh, another generation with your kids? And what's that like for you? It's, uh, it's a way of life. Um, it would be completely different if none of the kids uh, were interested. You know, would we have continued to invest um, in people and equipment and building the way we have, uh, knowing that nobody would be interested? Uh, that that would have been a tough question. Thank God we don't have to ask that question. Um, we have three kids. Two of the three kids are uh, involved in the business. Celine is the next winemaker to be. Uh, she has the taste buds. Uh, she has the understanding of growing the grapes. She grew up on this farm. Um, she, we drink wine. We taste wine. We talk wine. Uh, our lives are all about wine. And sailing, marrying Tom. Tom is more a beer guy and a distiller understanding grain fermentation, grain distilling. Uh, is the distiller at the distillery. So as a couple, uh, they will be running the uh, winery and the distilling operation. We have a son, uh, Roman, who is a chef, and we are going to uh, start uh, this year uh, a um, food service program where we will be offering sandwiches and um, food on site, uh, which eventually will grow into a restaurant. Uh, but in a few years, we, you know, we have to learn how to walk before we can run. Um, and that will be his responsibility. So when it comes to the wine, yes, uh, wine and spirit, uh, it's on a good path and as well as the food. What was it like when the distilling operation kind of started here in Brandy? I mean, obviously, Brandy is such a, there's such an attachment with the state of Wisconsin and Brandy, and people absolutely love Brandy. Uh, what was it like to kind of unroll that and get that process started here? Uh, was it kind of like this, uh, a level of just new interest in, in Wollersheim? Actually, you know, it's an interesting. It, it is, it's twofold to the answer and the question. One, I started 20 some years ago with my father-in-law, Bob Wodersheim, him and I, um, sitting down in the cellar. Uh, it would be so awesome if we could do a Wisconsin cognac. Mm. So back then, the law, uh, did not allow Wisconsin winery to be distilleries. You, as an individual, you could start a distillery, but us as a family winery owner couldn't. It was against the law. In 2009, my wife Julie and two other, uh, one winery and one distillery got together and petitioned the legislation and were uh, allowed to have a, a change in the law allowing Wisconsin winery to also be distilleries. So 2010, we started uh, distilling and brandy was a natural evolution from the wine business. Brandy is from grapes. A lot of people don't realize that. Brandy is fermented grape wine. You could make apple brandy from fermented apple juice, becoming apple wine distilled to become apple brandy. But when you say brandy, it is grapes. So being grape grower, understanding barrel aging, fermentation, it was a natural start. And one of the reasons why we went big with the distillery goes back to one of your question about Wisconsin wine. Wisconsin wine will always be impossible to sell outside of the Midwest. So, you know, we are already a big winery. We make a lot of wine. How much more can we do? Will there be a point where there is a saturation level in the market? We have seen winery go from eight in the 90s to 120, 
today. Can it sustain itself? No. Right now, consumption of wine and, and beverage in general is plateauing. The growth is with the kids turning 21 years old, but outside of that, outside of that, it's not, we are not gaining new customer fast enough. So for us as a family owned business, independent, no outside investment to continue to think that we can continue to sustain the growth of the business only with the wine is ludicrous. It, it could plateau and when a business plateau, it's going backwards. So it's been our attitude to always grow uh, sustainably, moderately, slowly, but grow. And the distillery will allow us to expand our sales outside of Wisconsin, which right now we are not even interested because we don't make enough product to supply Wisconsin. But if someday... We want to export brandy, bourbon, whiskey, gin to Canada, to Illinois, to Missouri, to California. We can because there is not a stigma of a geographical provenance of the spirit like there is with wine. So selling Wisconsin wine in California, it's impossible. You will never achieve that because of the reputation of Midwest wine. And that is very unfortunate. Will the next generation with my daughter and my grandkids, will it be different? I hope so. But it goes back to, you know, you could be a French, Italian, California, Oregon, and Washington. You have the red carpet everywhere you go regardless of price, style, and quality. It doesn't matter. When you say Wisconsin, you have a struggle. So that's a little bit of reason why we went with the distillery as big as we did for bourbon, uh, whiskey, rye whiskey, gin, absinthe, and brandy. And we want to position ourselves as a brandy house, um, because we strongly believe in it. Uh, we know what we are doing. Um, and why couldn't a Wisconsin made brandy have equal chance as a Corbel brandy or as a Copper and King or as a Gallo product and so on. So, uh, we have a lot of hope that uh, brandy is going to be huge for uh, the distillery. What is your, like the favorite part of being a winemaker for you here at Wallersheim? What, what, what gives you the most joy? Uh, able to drink what I make and grow and I w yeah. with, with passion, you know, mm -hmm. just like, wow, this is good. And, you know, we garden, I am a hunter. I a bow hunt uh, all the time. Uh, so you have venison, Wisconsin cheese, uh, sweet corn from the local farm, tomato from the garden, um, lettuce from the garden, zucchini from the garden, and a bottle of Domaine du Sac, bottle of Domaine Reserve or Prairie Fumé to while the grill is going. It just doesn't get any better. It's all grown within feet. Uh, within yards of uh, where we are. So uh, you could say from the winery, you could draw half mile, half of a mile circle. You have the grain for the rye whiskey, for the white corn bourbon. You have the Wisconsin oak. Uh, you have venison from the woods, uh, tomato from the garden. It's all here. So it, th that's the pride of like, wow, this is good. This is... This is an awesome taste, you know. So obviously, uh, wine and food are very important to you as in, in, in your happiness and things. And, I'm, you know, there's a lot of ways that wine can be uh, used in cooking, and there's different ways of doing that. Do you have, like, a favorite meal to prepare using wine? Hmm. 
favorite meal. We use wine all the time with everything. But yes, I would say uh, venison backstrap marinated in wine, um, grilled on the grill uh, with a wine reduction that was used in the marinade and uh, a bottle of Domaine Resolve or Domaine du Sec. That, I would say that's my ultimate uh, meal. Mm. So we've talked about some of the, the fun parts of being uh, a winemaker here, but there's got to be some moments of anxiety because, like, uh, are, you know, especially this time of year, are my grapes okay out there? I mean, what's the most, like, anxiety or the, like, the most challenging part of, of what you do? Uh, twofold. Um, one is the weather, and one is that ultimately we deal with a perishable product. You know, sometimes I I have a lot of friends in the business, and I envy those uh, selling nuts and bolts uh, because it doesn't go bad. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, but when it's uh, you talk, it's a perishable product. Um, it, thank God it ages in the barrel, especially the spirits. But ultimately. Uh, you have to turn that into cash. Um, making it is the easy part. Selling it is the challenging part. But the anxiety level for us is the um, uh, the weather and the growing of the grapes. Uh, it's farming, you know. And sometimes we have a lot of TV station come to us and say, hey, tell us about the frost and the freeze. And, th- and I'm thinking, man, I'm just such a tiny little drop in the bucket Go check with all the thousands of farmers around here. I mean, what we do, yes, it's it's very visible, but what we do is a drop in the bucket compared to all the guys that have to be out in a weather like today, feeding the calves, scraping the manure in the yard, uh, sleeping on ice, uh, and taking care of the livestock uh, in weather condition. So back to us. Um, Yes, I am very concerned with this year. It's a long time since we've seen uh, 20 below, 30 below uh, for an extended period of time. Will there be some uh, crop loss? Yes. How much? Um, 20, 30, 40% crop reduction. That's, I would say... Uh, a good guess. Is it um, detrimental for the business? No. Uh, we have a lot of grapes grown outside of Wisconsin. We have contract with growers in Washington State, in Oregon, and New York State. Uh, I'm concerned with the New York State fellow. I need to talk to them. I haven't checked with them yet. I hope I would have heard if it was really bad, um, but it's it's going to be uh, it's going to be an issue uh, in the Upper Midwest, no question about that. You know, all the Great Lakes area, uh, Minnesota, Michigan, um, Michigan, um, MSU has already published a paper on uh, vineyard loss what we call bud kiln, the the little shoots, the buds have froze already. So um, so there will be some issue. Uh, is it surmountable? Yes, it is. Um, my biggest concern right now is the trunk, the health of the vine. The buds are dead. Okay, we'll find some live buds somewhere, but is the vine completely alive? And uh, we won't know that for another uh, three or four weeks. So that the farming of the grape, I think, is the anxiety part. Is there, I mean, is, is there anything you can do? Uh, this, you just kind of have to wait out the winter, and that's what it is. You, there's, you can't go out there and... No, no there's, just there's no, nothing Nothing you can do. Uh, you know, in the spring of the year, we battle spring frost. Uh, we have invested in equipment to minimize the loss. Um, it happens... It's the laws of nature. Um, it's farming. Um, we are seeing weather changes affecting uh, vineyard practices. There's, that's uh, 
we've seen it happening. We do a lot more mulching underneath the vine to minimize erosion, preserve water uh, in case of drought. Lately, we have had to deal with a lot of rain. Is it affecting the taste of the wine? Yes. Uh, can we adjust to it? Yes, to some point. Uh, you cannot replace the sunlight. I mean, sunlight is quality uh, of the wine. So can we increase sunlight penetration in the vine? Yes, we can remove some canopy. We can remove some leaves. We can train the vine differently uh, to have more sunlight penetration, minimizing uh, fungus and so on. Yeah, that's all. It's a, it's a science. It's an art. Uh, we can deal with that. Um, but sunlight is quality of the grapes, quality of the wine. So you, you mentioned that it, it probably won't affect the, the business, so you'll still be able to make w you know, wine for you. Um, but I'm wondering if uh, some of the other smaller uh, wineries around the state that maybe you have relationships with or contact with, uh, are, are they doing okay with this winter? We, everybody is concerned. We talk a lot in the industry what is it going to be? What is it going to be? We don't know yet. Long as it's frozen, we mm -hmm. cannot even go out and, and check. Um, it's pointless. You know, I could have gone last week, but it's going to be zero in a couple of days. Well, do we get damage at zero? Yes, we can. If the bud is already partially dead at zero, it can finish it. And then will it get colder yet? So, um, we won't know, I would say for another, three or four weeks, uh, the extent of the damage. One of the interesting things about craft beer and craft beer locally is that a lot of them are doing collaborations. They do, they, you know, have shared brewing or they'll make a shared, um, you know, beer. And I'm wondering if, if, if you do any kind of collaborations with other wineries or, um, I mean, do you, how do you approach collaboration? You know, is that something that Wallersheim's interested in? We have done it for 40 years mm. and our collaboration to with the industry is that we have welcomed all the wineries of Minnesota, Illinois, um, and Wisconsin have at some point of time visited this place, come here, and uh, we that has been our attitude. The more of us know how to make better wine, the better it is for uh, the Wisconsin wine section and for the industry. Um, we have uh, collaborated with Great Dane. Uh, we're making a, a Belgian prairie with Prairie Fumé. Uh, it's been going on, I think, four years. Uh, and I think we, a uh, great Dane is going to be releasing some barrel age, uh, Belgian, Belgian prairie, uh, at a beer festival in Madison sometime this, uh, spring or summer. Uh, we have worked with Levi Funk also to do some natural, uh, beer and wine. Um, and we are always uh, looking ahead of, you know, what's happening next. Uh, we are always looking at different packaging. You know, we were one of the first ones to do screw cap as of 2005. Uh, our customer, I would say 72% of our customer didn't like the idea of screw cap. Thank God we didn't listen and we <laughs> went ahead um, because that's the best closure there is. So... Modern packaging, bag in box, can is uh, is the way of the future. Uh, are we looking into all that? Absolutely. Um, so uh, always looking ahead. You know, it's uh, I'm 56 years old. My grandkids, their generation won't care if the wine is coming out of a glass bottle or or can, uh, long as it's good. Uh, customer are going to enjoy it uh so if i were to come back here this summer you know a little nicer scenery probably um or, or for somebody who's coming here the first for the first time wh what would you suggest to like get the most out of like coming here get the, getting the experience like enjoying being here how would you how would you kind of set up their day for them um 
I think walking along the path and discovering the beauty of the courtyard with the old building, the old house, all the flowers. Uh, I mean, you are transported back to Europe uh, when when you come up here. Um, I think you you could grab a glass of wine, go sit out on the patio or by the shelter and kind of enjoy the scenery and the smell of the vineyard. Um, you could take a tour. We are open uh, 361 days a year, 10 to 5 every day. We offer tours and tasting every day. Um, and the tour uh, really takes you through the history of the place from 1847 uh, through 1850s, the, build, the construction of the winery, 1876, making brandy, um, 1919, the prohibition, 1972, my in-laws, 1980s, myself and my wife, Julie, and the nine, 90s, the prairie fumé and all the building expansion and now the distillery. Uh, and then soon within six months, within two months, we should have food uh, on site. So there is so much to see. Um, I would say we are a very welcoming, open winery. You want to learn, you want to enjoy, um, you want to have food and wine, um, you can do it all. You, you can do it uh, while relaxing. Mm. You mentioned something when you were talking there, the smell of the vineyard. Um, can you tell me what it's, tell, describe it, what is the, a vineyard smell like when you're out walking amongst it? And, and what are some of the, I'm interested in like the smells of, of winemaking along the process. How, you know, smells are such a big part of food. So what, what is the, the process of smells along the way? I'm kind of interested. It, it, you know, it's funny because when you are in a car, um, you are not exposed to smell while you drive, unless there is a guy smoking a cigar, three cars <laughs> ahead of you. <laughs> right. However, when you drive motorcycle, you smell everything. Mm. You smell manure in the field. You smell fresh cut hay. You smell a locust tree. Um, and so... For me, a sense of smell and sense of taste is, uh, it's always, I mean, I smell everything, I taste everything. Um, so the smell of the vineyard, it has its own smell. You know, the, the vines sweat like a tree sweats. And when you walk in the vineyard and you, you and I, you could say, wow, you smell like the vineyard. It has its own, uh, own smell. The bloom, is uh, sweet like honey. It's like honeysuckle. It's mm. like a uh, locust flower, like lily of the valley. It's a very perfumey smell. And that's about a week uh, of time, June 10th to June 20th. About That's when the vineyard is in bloom. Um, it, it smells so great. And then later on, you have the grapes that are ripening on the vine. Um like a like a, a ripening fruit and sweetness, and then after that it intensify with fermentation. I mean, you have fermentation. You have two hundred thousand gallons of wine fermenting. It fills the air. It's mm. uh, very aromatic. And then you know you go to the distillery. You have the mash fermenting. Uh, so you can go from one. And a lot of people coming to visit with us. You walk through the building. You have the barrels in the basement in the old cellar and you walk through the building every room smells has a different smell you know from pumping wine to fermenting to going to the distillery i think the biggest example is when you walk into the barrel aging at the distillery wow this is heaven it's brandy and whiskey smell it's it's pretty awesome hmm. you know i mean we are so passionate what we do you know from the growing of the grapes to understanding what what's going on out in nature uh, the environment of the grapes um dealing with the deer and the turkeys and the weather uh, making the wine um wine and food you know this is this is what we like to share you know um wine is good Enjoyed in moderation, 
Um, sometimes we design a meal around a bottle of wine, not the other way around. So, mm-hmm. hey, I'm cooking fish. What should I drink? Well, I have this great Pinot Noir. I'm going to build a meal around that, those wines, you know. Sometimes that's the way we do it. I want to drink two or three bottles of wine with some friends. Then we're going to design the meal around the wine. Mm-hmm. You could do it either way, but um, it, it's always... Food and wine, food and wine, food and wine. That's that's our lives. Thanks to Philippe and his family for hosting me at the winery. I got a nice tour and tasting while I was there. I'm looking forward to return uh, sometime this summer. Make sure to subscribe to the Wisconsin Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play. You can also stand a little bit about the pod by visiting wispod.com and following the show on Twitter at Wispodcast and on Facebook at the Wisconsin Podcast. Cheers! Cheers!